It's got to be around here somewhere. Um, is it? Um, no. No. Ooh. Ooh, I forgot about these. Ooh, which one shall we have a look at today? So, what cassette did I choose? Well, it's quite obvious because you've read the title of this, but I chose this. The Thompson LN90. Now, if you guys don't know why this cassette here is a bit special, then you don't know the history of Thompson. In fact, the history of Thompson, son, not Thompson as in the big French conglomerate, would make a video on its own, but I don't have the time really to do it. But they seem to be a company that made bootleg audio cassettes for the Indonesian and Far Eastern market. But I've actually found Thompson bootlegs in the UK. I've, I found some in a charity shop and they're very good quality. And all of them universally seem to be on Maxell tape. I mean, look at this one here. Yeah, this is a different style of tape to this, but it still says Maxell and it says UD and it's good quality. It's a very good quality recording. And if you look on eBay, you can find loads of these. So I don't know what to make of them. You know, did, did, did Maxell okay this? Did, you know, you wouldn't really think a big company like Maxell would want their name on bootleg products. But then saying that, this company didn't seem to have a problem with knocking off other people's music, so why would it have a problem knocking off Max L's name? But either way, the, I find them very enigmatic. The cassettes look different. They, like I say, it's bizarre. They didn't go to the to the length of just creating a paper label overlay. They they created cassettes that look like blanks with like sort of printed titles on them but they look handwritten. It's like they were trying the best they could to look like a bootleg. And that's what brings me to, to this cassette and why when I saw it on eBay, I had to buy it. I mean, it's not new, but it's like, hang on, this is a blank Thompson because if we look at the back, you know, it says Thompson LN90, extra low noise, high output, normal bias, E120 equalization. And if we look at that, and especially this bit here, it looks like one of the older generation Max LUDs like this. It's not an exact copy, but you certainly know where the inspiration was being taken from. But more importantly, if we look at the cassette itself, as we can see, it says there, made in Japan by Max L. And this shell, can you see it with the very distinctive diamond patterns on it? This shell looks very, very much like this Maxell LN from the early 80s. Now, like I say, I haven't had this cassette from new. It wasn't sealed. But if we look at the leader, that looks like a genuine Maxell leader. Put the side A on there, let's just get this out there so we can focus. Can you see that properly? The side A there, and then we've got the distinctive stripage there, which shows which way the tape runs. This looks like a Maxell leader inside a Maxell shell. And you know something, I've just had a thought now. Let me just pause this. I'm gonna open this up so we can have a look at the hubs. Okay, the, the hubs are inconclusive. They don't not look like Maxell, but they don't look like Maxell because I haven't got one of the older LNs or UDs at hand to compare them. They don't look like, you know, Maxell hubs from like the 85 range onwards. But uh, yeah, that's what it looks like inside. So yeah, that was a bit of a misadventure, but I thought it was worth a look. I'll be right back. 
So inconclusive there, but I thought it was worth a look. But the more I look at the system, the more questions it, it makes me ask. It's like, it's got Dolby system printed on there. It doesn't have like a, a, a Y or an N or a tick box or anything. And it says stereo and it's got EMB 454. It's like, was this one of their bootleg cassettes that they just didn't print the label properly for? Is that what it is? But then we've got the J card, which, you know, it, it's, it's a J card. This isn't an album cover. It looks like it was designed to be blank. And it, it just, just raises so many questions, you know. I mean, I know there was... Ah, I remember this cassette. I've just, just popped into my head now, this cassette. The Maxwell. Shame I haven't got any of them to hand neither because maybe this is a Maxwell that was copied and then they put Maxwell on it to make it more sellable. But that doesn't. But the Maxwell didn't have Maxwell type leaders on the tape. Yeah, it's, it just. It, this thing raises more questions than, than I can answer, but. I guess the uh, the proof of the pie is in the eating, I guess. Let's get this calibrated up and let's see if this is a Type 0 or if it's any good. Because, like I say, the, the Thompson pre-recordings I've had have all sounded really good. So, uh, yeah, let's, let's see if this one does too. Right, I'm going to use my old friend, the Iowa. Uh, I love this deck. I love this deck because even though it's a late deck, again, it records brilliant. You give me a cassette recorded on this and tell me this was recorded on a ZX9. Listening back to it, I wouldn't be able to tell you any difference because it makes good recordings. Recordings that have plenty of bed treble, plenty of bass, plenty of space in them. Good enough. And the beauty of this deck is that it's very simple on the inside because it's a light deck. It's not cram full of wires and boards. Very easy board to work on. I calibrated this myself. I uh, rebelted it myself because when I bought it, it was utterly broke. And I think this is a deck that I could keep going for a while, but I, I just love this deck. Anyway, so the Thompson, like I said, gold's a bit hard to, there we go. The Thompson, so let's see. Have this calibrate, see if it calibrates well, decent, see how it records. So, okay, calibrate it. Let's have a look. Okay, so let's take out some bias, get it matched up to the okay, okay, and then give it a little bit of level. I'd say we're about there, just, just maybe maybe had a touch more bias, but yeah, for a, for a used tape which is easily over 30 years old, it does calibrate up. QL. So I'm going to record this at around about two. You know, it's a basic ferric. Don't want to do it more than two. Now, the track I'm going to use here is called Digifunk from a an artist called Div Kid. And I don't know why you'd want to call yourself Div Kid because when I was young, if someone said you, you're a Div, uh, that wasn't a sign of affection. But um, hell, what do I know about the youth? Anyway, let's get it recording. And let's listen to a bit of Div Kid.
Well, if that isn't a Maxell tape, it's a really, really good tape all the same. I mean, you know, that was peaking at, at some point it almost hit six, but it was doing four quite regularly. But uh, yeah, this, uh, this recorded really well. They sounded good. It's a nice firm shell. It had the leaders. Oh, I've actually not shown you the tape, have I? Yeah, it's a yeah, usual brownie ferric. I mean, I don't think it's I don't think it's uh, cobalt doped, but I gotta be honest, this performed more like a UD than an LN. And I think this is probably a later cassette. I don't know why I think that, but. I think it's a later cassette than the LM. This is probably mid '80s, going into '90s, perhaps. But yeah, that that sounded really good. And uh, if this isn't a Maxell tape in there, doesn't matter because it, it's a good tape. Full stop. Simples. The truth. So yeah, that, that was a really good sounding cassette. If I had a, a stash of these, you know, uh, I'd be quite happy to record stuff on it and it sounds good and yeah, really happy with it. So I did a bit more digging and um, there's not a lot out there about the actual origins of the company, at least not in English anyway, that I can understand and I couldn't seem to find any other stuff. but. To what, although they were in Indonesia, it seems these were very Middle East focused. I've found stuff from guys who used to live in Dubai and UAE and Bahrain saying that, you know, they didn't get official releases of stuff until, you know, the mid to late 90s. And so the Thompson stuff, and there was also a brand called Thames, I believe, as well, which they used to go to the small music shops, pay the equivalent of $3 for, and they would get a cassette that was always of good quality and most of the other results I've found for these are um, people that said you know I, I remember having these or I bought them when I was in the Gulf War and all of them universally say that they are brilliant sounding cassettes. So I also had a, a, a bit of a deeper look and I found this picture. Now that looks to me like a BASF shell, that looks like a mid 80s BASF shell. So I've no reason to doubt that they didn't have BASF tape in them. So here's a theory and you know, you can, you know, we've got nothing else to go off, but, but why would you take a regular market cassette, you know, a consumer N blank, make your own label on it and then print on it with like a stamp. Why wouldn't you just get duplicator cassettes and do it like duplication houses would? You know, just run them off en masse, you know, loads of them. And this is my theory. My theory is that these cassettes were not made in one factory. I mean, think about it. If you've got a big bootleg operation going, you've got it all targeted in one place, someone's gonna come and shut you down eventually. I mean, you know, that, that's the way it would work. So you don't have one factory. You've got lots of factories. So you have to set up lots of factories. How about if you don't set up lots of factories? How about if you just have loads of people rattling copies off for you? Imagine, you know, I used to do cassettes for Red Manor, you know, I, I, you can get a few cassette decks and if you're running them at full chat, you can run off maybe 50 copies a day. So what you do is you buy a load of consumer market blank cassettes, you know, you don't bulk buy duplicated cassettes. And I mean, even in them days, you got to think, did duplicated cassettes exist? Do they only exist now? because of lack of consumer cassettes. Because duplicated cassettes in the old days, you know, the, I don't think the duplicators bought the cassettes already in the shell, you know, they do them out of shell on the big pancakes, do them fast and then load them into the shells afterwards, wouldn't they? So maybe duplicated cassettes weren't available, I don't know in them days, you know, and the duplication was done purely 
through people duplicating them out of pancakes. So you buy whatever cassettes are available on, in bulk, you peel the labels off, you print your own labels, but you leave them blank like this. You ship these to all the various people who've got garages or basements where they run copies off for you. And because therefore these are probably being done on cassette decks at single speed, or maybe, I don't know if they're doing high speed dubbing decks because everyone says the quality is excellent and the, one, the ones which I've got, which are pre-recorded, do sound excellent. So you've got all these little people with a cottage industry, so to speak, running these copies off for you and they don't always know what they're doing every day so you didn't get these pre-printed with the actual titles of the albums on and once they'd taken it out of the machine and they've been copied they had a rubber stamp and they stamped it you know here we go dark side of the moon stamped and then they just take the inserts you send them a load of inserts they put them in there and that's how these were made so they weren't in one central location for uh, people to shut them down they were made by people in their houses garages basements whatever running these off you just sent them these cassettes which were bought en masse whatever was available cheaply peeled the label off stuck your own label on and then they could stamp whatever cassette it was and then they send them to a central distribution that's that's a theory that works for me that's what i probably believe it was um so i don't doubt these are genuine maxell i don't doubt that the bs ones uh, a basf tape it's just like i say they were done homemade bootlegs for a big company but ultimately now i think these are very sweet very collectible and people seem to love them because they were good quality because they were probably done on consumer decks which would have to be well maintained in order to keep the copies going and going and going so they sound sweeter than the you know the high speed dubbed ones on you know you know regular duplication tape because they're on a decent max cell so that's where i think these are but like i said i've never seen another blank one i i, I can't understand them wanting to sell blanks unless well yeah unless they just bought a load of these took the labels off put the other labels on and said hey we, we can look more legit as blank but if if you were somebody that used to buy these regularly in the day or if you have any more insight into thompson then please do leave a comment and i'll respond to you because it, it, it's 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 like i say it's, it's enigmatic these cassettes and i'm really proud to have a blank thompson cassette that's why i paid over the odds for it just because never seen one before so there we go thanks for watching don't forget i have another youtube channel if you want to hear me talking about model cars at the moment but i'll get into some vintage video games and stuff later but it's here it's uh, tony's toy chest youtube channel and don't forget if you want to buy any model cars etc please have a look at my website tony's toy chest.co.uk but until then don't forget that cassette comeback canada is still going if you're over the other side of the atlantic so go to cassettecomeback.com for all your atlanta no, well all of your american based cassette goodies but as always oh no i sound like tech Mon. i can't say as always you see that's it i've watched so much tech Mon. i'm trying to mimic him sorry matt not doing that so thanks for watching happy taping bye bye